Let's just talk about some of those Power Apps challenges, right? So you're a Power Apps beginner, or maybe you're a seasoned pro who's kind of faking it. It's okay. All right, either way, we're going to go over today is five core tips, plus a bonus one, because I wasn't allowed to call it six tips. I don't know why. Anyway, five core tips that help beginners with Power Apps, right? So we're going to talk about forms, we're going to talk about renaming controls, we're going to talk about error messages, and then just some things about, you know, Power Apps wants what it wants, right? So we're just going to kind of go over these core things. So nothing super technical, just a bunch of little thoughts that'll help you hopefully transition from beginner scared of everything to that intermediate where you're like, all right, you kind of got an idea what's going on. Sound fun? Well, let's just switch over to my desktop and take a look. All right, the first tip is one that causes me great pain. And that's why I'm going to tell you that forms are fine, right? So for the forms control is very easy to use and a great starting point. Now, the reason I make this my first tip is because if you've watched a bunch of YouTube videos or how to's or you've seen some cool blog posts, it's real easy to be like, hey, you know, everybody says I should always use patch, right? And as a seasoned pro, I always use patch. I do not like forms, right? But forms are great to start. And when in the beginning, all you want is success. You need to win. Forms are going to help you do that. So let's just go over here and build a quick app with forms, right? So first thing I got to do is add a data source. I'm going to click over here on data. I'm going to add data. I'm going to search for SharePoint. Then I'm going to click on SharePoint right here, choose my connection. And keep in mind that this would work the same if your data source was SQL, Excel, Dataverse. It doesn't matter. Right? This isn't SharePoint specific here. But now we're going to go to Power Apps Videos, cuts my SharePoint site. I'm going to search for my employees list, click on that, and then click connect down here under my face. Okay, so now that you've got a data source, once again, I don't care which one you do, I'm going to choose a tree view. And then if you just insert a gallery, connect it up to your list, right? We're not trying to teach this, we're just not trying to overdo it. And so then we're going to insert a form, drag it over here. With your form, then all I need you to do is choose a data source that's that same list, employees. This is going to automatically add some or all columns, just depending on where you're at with things. And then the thing that they don't call out is up here in the drop down, you've got to choose item. This is where you tell it what to show in the form. And then here you would just choose your gallery name. So gallery one dot selected. Notice I'm using tab completes to make my life easier. Bingo, bingo. And if you insert a button, and then here you would just say submit form and the name of your form like so. And there you go. Just like that, I have an app, right? We could play, we could save, we could publish it. Or I could go in here and choose Greg the truck driver and be like, hey, his favorite color is blue. And I press this button and it saves, right? Forms are okay. They, they have challenges. They can't do fancy things necessarily. So look, so here's an example of an app like where we need patch, right? So yes, we start with forms, but like this one is one that I use to check out quantities of stuff, right? It not only lets you choose how many you want to borrow, you can sign the form, all of this stuff, right? These are the type of things that you will evolve into complex apps like this. I'll put a link to how to build this app up there. This needs patch, right? You will get to the point where you need patch, but today you're a beginner using forms, totally a okay. All you're looking to do is most likely capture some data, right? So whether the forms in edit mode, new mode, whatever, right? like there's a bunch more to learn about forms. I'm not oversimplifying it, but I want you to understand that it's okay to start with forms. You do not have to get hung up on people like me that say, Hey, I would never use forms. I would never use forms, but I'm not you. You're still learning. So that's my first tip for beginners. Forms are okay. Now, if you're struggling with what I just did there, like you're like, whoa, 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 you went so fast. Why did you do all that? All right. Remember, I've got a great training class, a free 101 level training class. You just sign up your email address, no money, no credit cards, no nothing. And that will walk you through how to build your first app and do all that. If you don't want my training class, I don't know why, right? The other thing to remember is we open a new tab here is that the starting place and what I teach in that class is you go here to create. And then what you're going to do is you're just going to choose like in our case, SharePoint, you're going to connect to SharePoint here. You're going to find that same site again, Power Apps videos and find that same list. So employees for me. Click connect under my face again. And in like three seconds, it is going to build us a complete working app. This working app, it's a three screen app that lets you edit, create, delete records, all of those fun things is wonderful. This is where you should learn. You should come mess with this app because it has the gallery like we just did. It has the form. This is how you learn. This is how you use forms. This can be the foundation of your app. Start here. All right, so for number two, flow is both your friend and your foe. Right? What? I know. Okay. So one of the things that I cannot stress enough with you is that sometimes I see a beginner is like they went and watched a video. Once again, it's always video's fault, but they watched a video that showed how to send an email with flow. And they're like, Hey, that's really easy. I can do that. Great. But 
What I don't want you to do is come in here to your Power App and add that flow if all you want that flow to do is send an email, right? If Power Apps can do what you want to do, then you are always better off to do the work in Power Apps and keep it all in the Power Apps bubble, right? There's a lot of things that only Flow can do, like uploading a file, we need a Flow. Uh, sending, you know, Teams adaptive cards and getting responses, we need a Flow. Creating a PDF, we need a Flow. There's a lot of things that only Flow can do. So don't get me wrong, we integrate Flow and Power Apps all the time, but I don't want you integrating Flow just for the sake of having Flow in here, right? If you needed to send an email from Power Apps, what would you do, right? We just made a new screen real quick. We go over here, data sources. We would say add data. We would search for Outlook. Make sure we choose Office 365 Outlook. We'll click on that, we use our connection. This will add this as a data source into our app, just like so. And now you can just have a simple button here. And this button, you would just do Office 365 Outlook dot send email v2 right there. Then you just fill in the blanks. Look, it's telling you I need a two, a subject, and a body. So the two, let's just have it send to the logged in user, right? So user dot email, subject, subject, and then body, body. There you go. That button will send an email. Now you would just learn to fill in the blanks as you go. But there's no reason to go build that in a flow and then have integrated flow and a power app, right? That, so that's why I say flow is both friend and foe. Because a lot of times I see beginners incorporating flows to do things they can do in power apps. Remember, they both have all the same connectors. So if you're just talking to a data source, you're just sending an email, you're just posting into a Teams chat, all of that can happen over here. Okay, tip number three, rename some of your controls. There's a lot of advice out there on the internet that says, hey, you should rename all your controls. Like if we look over here, you can see my app all of a sudden, you know, we've done nothing and I've got what, a dozen controls? The official guidance is you should rename all those. I'm naturally lazy. I don't have time to rename all those controls. So here's my advice to you. I only rename controls that I'm going to use somewhere else. So for example, say that here with our little send an email button, we wanted to have a text input where they could write their own subject, right? So we'd go here, We'd insert a text input and then we'd clear out the default text. And so then now we could go here to button two and say, hey, subject, right? It's just text. We're going to say text input one dot text. And then maybe what we're going to do is we'll insert a label above that and we'll say subject. In this scenario, I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, what is text input one? So I would have to go over here and figure it out. And what if we kind of duplicated this whole thing? Let's just copy. Copy and paste. I right, did control C and control V. And then we're just going to change this to say body. And so now this is text input one underscore one, right? So then you go here to body and you'd be like, hey, this is text input one underscore one dot text. So that would send an email with whoever's in those fields. That is not super intuitive. So in this particular scenario, if we're looking at screen two, I would not rename my label. I'd go here and say, hey, you, you're going to be, and I can double click here to rename it, right? So input body, and then we're going to hear text input one, and maybe this time we'll use the ellipses and say rename, and we're going to say input subject. Now look at our formula. So one, Power Apps is great. Power Apps automatically renamed the references, so I didn't have to go rename in the formula. But see how much easier this is to figure out? So Office 365 Outlook send email to the logged in user's email, cool. Subject comes from that text box. Body comes from that one. When I rename things, I only rename things that provide me an advantage. Typically, it's going to be controls that I'm referencing somewhere else. I have never in the history of mankind ever renamed a label, right? Who cares? Does it matter to me if this is label one or label one underscore one? No, don't rename them. If you have a reason it matters to you, leave it in the comments because I'd love to hear it. But you can rename them. But I, I just, I'm not going to rename all of them. So that's my advice to you. A little side tip on that one. I would also say if you are going to rename things, well, no, you are going to rename things. But I want you to try to find consistency in patterns. There's plenty of naming guides out there, conventions. I don't follow any one particular guide. But I have a pattern for me, right? So all my variables start with VAR. All my collections start with COL. All my inputs start with INP, right? So what I really want from you is not to follow any one pattern. I want you to say, hey, I'm always going to do it. I want you to follow your pattern, make up your own set and do it that way. Another little side tip when it comes to things like videos, right? So say for example, that you went and watched the video on how to upload multiple files, right? That's what this one does. It lets you drag and drop. We can select multiple files. We got cute pictures of Buddy now. You know, when you do this, leave yourself hints, right? So if you use a video, leave a code comment that says, I'll use this video. 
or if I use the blog post or use a piece of documentation. Remember, like I could just go here to my upload button with all of its crazy complexity and I would just go to the top and I would just do two forward slashes and be like, built using this video and then I would just throw in the URL of the video. I don't have the URL handy, right? I'll put the URL or I'll put the URL down in the description for you guys. But, you know, leaving yourself notes like this, like don't think about the documentation as something that you do in case you win the lottery or hit the bus, depending on if you're a half glass or half full or half empty type of person. But think about documentation as something that will help future you, right? If you're coming in six months from now and you're trying to figure out how you built this and trying to troubleshoot it and you really didn't know what you did the first time, you just copied some code off of a blog post, it wouldn't be nice if you had a link to that blog post right here. So another little tip for my Power Apps beginners. Number four, it's about labels, right? So for my Power Apps beginners, one of the things I want to stress with you is you cannot use labels enough. Because labels give you a chance to expose things. I, I We do support here at Power Apps 901, right? We get them with people and do like a Teams chat and just help them fix their app and we never talk to them again, right? Like we, we have that support service available. And so as part of that, I can't tell you how often I'll be troubleshooting with someone and they'll be like, and something's not working. And I'll be like, well, what's in that variable? And they're like, oh, it's it's it says Bob, right? Like it's, it's no problem. And But the whole logic depends on that variable having Bob stored in it. And it turns out that something else in their app is triggering or not triggering, and that variable is not getting sent in with Bob. So I always, always, always tell people, hey, when you're troubleshooting, we want to use labels, right? So I say we were going to go here, we had a quick text input. And so then in that text input, we're going to have ourselves a button, and we're going to take whatever they put on text input and put it into a variable. So we could do something like this. We'd say set var dog name. And then we're going to have that be, we know it's text input 2.txt, so I would rename this. I'm not going to now because remember that whole lazy thing. <laughs> so we do that. And then we're going to have them go to another screen. So we do a new screen, blank, back over here. And so we're going to do a semicolon and then navigate to screen three. So now if they go here and they type in buddy and they press this button, it takes them to the screen, but that variable is set. And so here, maybe what we're going to do is we're going to uh, insert a smiley face. There's a smiley face and we're going to say, hey, smiley face, I want your color. So if we go up here to its color and we're going to say if var dog name equals buddy, then what do we want to do? We want to do uh, the color dot green. And if not, we're going to do the color dot red. Now, look, it's red right now, but we just set it to buddy, right? So in these type of scenarios, if you're in the maker, so if you're building the app right now, what we could do is we go up here, we'd select var dog name, we can see the data type is text, and we can see the name is buddy, no capitalization difference. So that's how we could troubleshoot it while we're in a maker. But if I'm trying to troubleshoot that one user that's having weirdness, what I will do is I'll just throw a label on the screen while I'm testing, while I'm figuring these things out, and put var dog name there so I can visualize what's going on. Visualizing your variables, your controls, your outputs, the things that you're making decisions on, this is the number one tip for troubleshooting. Labels, labels, labels. In Flow, I use compose, compose, compose. So then what might I do in this scenario? What I might do is I'm like, all right, well, clearly I was looking for capital. So then I could find out that there is a function in Power Apps called upper, and that would take a string like var buddy and change it to all uppercase. So now I'm not having to worry about whether they capitalize the B or not, whether they capitalize the whole thing. So I could remove that from the, the scenario. But the thing was, is that this label is what hopefully helped me get there by being able to visualize what did it type in. The other thing that you might find out like is that maybe there's some function on the screen that sets the variable to blank when they get here. So even though they're setting it over there, maybe in reality you had a, um, if you look on the screen, on visible, you somebody somewhere along the way wrote code that said set var dog name to Chewy, right? And so then now what happens? So if we go over here, if we type in buddy like we did, all right, we'll hit play, we press this button, the variable is getting set to Chewy. Clicking that button set it to buddy, but when this became visible, it got set to Chewy. These are the type of things that labels help you find out. And then of course, you've got the search over here where we could have just said, well, var dog name. And this would show you all the places and this might help you figure out where that's getting mysteriously set. Okay, labels, labels, labels. Okay, so for number five, let's go back over here. So number five, it's error messages. You see up here in the top right, the app checker, the stethoscope, this thing should never have a red dot. If it has a red dot, that means you stop right now and you figure out what's going on. Don't build your app with errors. Because what can happen, so like say we go here and we're messing around, we don't know what we're really doing, we're trying to troubleshoot something, and I type in 12. I'm like, hey, I wanna make var dog name 12. 
Notice it goes red right away, but I'm like, eh, we go away from there. But look, now we got red here. We go up here to the app checker. That one little thing caused four errors in my app. If you wait five minutes, five hours, five days before you try to figure it out, like which one of these is the problem, right? Is it the expected text value? Is it the argument type? Is it function? I don't know, okay? But if I know, if as soon as the red thing showed up, when we cause the error, we know that we introduced the error here, so we can go back, we could hit the drop down here, incompatible type, we hit edit the formula bar, and we realize that incompatible type says, hey, basically, you're using this as a text variable in some places, but by typing 12 there, you made it a number variable, you can't have a variable be two things. So if you really wanted to be 12, you could, you know, throw some double quotes around, now it's the text one, two, and now look, the error is gone. Because those other three errors were all just problems because you broke this variable. They were things that depended on the variable. Imagine you tried to solve the wrong one of those, right? Like you would have had to dig and dig and dig. Anytime, like I literally just, I can't physically build an app if the red dot is on it. Get yourself trained the same way. Your peripheral vision is always looking for that red dot. If it shows up, we fix that problem right away so we can go forward and solve small problems. If, you, if you've if you caused the error, you can fix the error. If you got a bunch of errors, you got to fix them later, it's a lot harder. So as beginners, just don't ever build. If that red dot's up here, that means stop and figure out what you did wrong. Okay, so bonus tip here. And you kind of saw this as I was going through, but I purposely didn't use some words that I wanted to because I wanted to use them here. And that is Power Apps just wants what Power Apps wants. It doesn't care how you get there. This is the most fundamental lesson that I can offer you. I teach this in my beginning class. I teach this in my intermediate class. I teach this in my advanced class. Because even as a pro, we fall into traps of writing really complicated things because we get away from this idea that Power Apps just wants what it wants, right? Like, so if you go here, let's just insert another label. If we want to set the font size, right? So size is a number. It's the number 13. The key is that the size property just wants a number. It doesn't care how you get there. So if you do 13 times 2, which is 26, fine, right? 13 times 2 minus 3. Now it's 23, right? It's being calculated, but this output here spits out a number. If we have it do, um, if we want to set the size to something completely different, like count rows in employees, right? Count rows spits out a number. It doesn't care. So now the font size, there's 17 rows. So now the font size is 17. Power Apps just wants what it wants. It doesn't care how you do there. If you said, if today equals, and that's Christmas, then make the font 50. If not, be 20. It doesn't, it doesn't care that we use the formula. It doesn't matter. This is the number one challenge that everyone has when it comes to Power Apps, right? Because if you highlight this whole thing, it says I'm spitting out a number, I'm spitting out 20. We know that size one and 20. So if I was setting color, same thing. If I'm setting the text, if I'm trying to create a variable, if I'm trying to do a patch statement, Power Apps just wants what it wants. And as long as you give it what it wants, you're going to be happy. Okay, so that's my thing for today, right? So as Power Apps beginners, just remember, don't overdo it, right? Starting simple, doing less advanced things is totally okay. You will get to the more advanced things. So don't, don't fret too much there. Also, you know, someone asked me the other day, I go, hey, how do I get better at this thing faster? You don't, right? You, you need to get your 10,000 hours. Yes, you can go take one of my training classes. We've got the free ones, you got the paid ones, we got the whole encompassing university. They can all help you grow in a more structured way. But at the end of the day, the main thing that I need you to do is to get your time in. Get in here, build an app, right? I've built apps for my kids' soccer. I've built apps to track my food purchases. I've built apps to take pictures of the dog. All of these things just got me more hours on the keyboard with Power Apps, helping me learn little things. Because, you know, you build something and you're like, hey, how do I do the next piece? And then you go find the video or go find the blog post or go find the class that teaches you the thing that you don't know how to do. So thoughts, questions, comments, Ways that I can help you, right? Hit me up over at powerapps911.com. With all that, I'm going to say thanks and have a great day.